probably $24 billion. We have three speakers to cover the topic. Ladies first. Dawn is here, and she is a, Dawn Hatch is a registered nurse who trained at Curry College in Milton. Looks as though she's done a million things since she graduated just a couple of years ago. She's currently a quality improvement specialist at, here at Lowell General. Adam Weston, whom we all know, is our ID guy, one of the, the three over six feet booming voice individuals. Adam is a cum laude graduate from Bowdoin College, which is also the alma mater of uh, our other speaker, and both graduated cum laude. Um, Adam went on to uh, get his doctor of medicine at uh, Tufts, where he was AOA, residency at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess, a master's degree in clinical research, and a fellowship at Tufts. Greg Shoemaker is a, as I said, a Bowdoin graduate, cum laude. He um, has an MBA in finance from New York University and uh, further education at Columbia University. Hahnemann School of Medicine was the source of his MD where he had honors in medicine. He is currently on the professorial staff at Tufts, where he is also pulmonary care and critical care sleep division. Uh, at Lowell General, he is medical director of the intensive care unit, and at Tufts is in charge of the pulmonary care, pulmonary care and sleep medicine. Um, without wasting more of your time, I think the speakers are best heard first. Adam? Sorry, it's Greg this morning. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, Byron, for <coughs> inviting us um, to, to talk about sepsis, a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, so, today um, I'm going to start kind of with a quick background on sepsis, and I'll go over kind of the broad management um, principles of uh, treating patients with sepsis, and then Adam will talk about the more specific sepsis syndromes and, and their treatments, um, with obviously a significant focus on the antibiotic management of sepsis. And then uh, Don will finish up with some uh, specific data about Lowell General's uh, experience with sepsis. So uh, Byron touched on some of this already, but you know, sepsis is a, a very um, highly morbid and mor mortal disease. Um, recent study from several uh, government agencies that look at healthcare spending have shown that uh, we're spending currently uh, at least $24 billion a year uh, treating patients with sepsis, uh, accounting for about 6% of healthcare costs uh, in the U.S and at least half a quarter of a million deaths a year uh, related to sepsis in the U.S. So, you know, why is sepsis such a highly morbid and mortal disease? And, and I think one of the issues that, that makes sepsis so uh, dangerous is that it is very heterogeneous. We don't have a definitive, easy diagnostic tool that says, you know, the person walking in the ED has sepsis. It's not like a STEMI where you have an EKG with an obvious finding. It's much more heterogeneous. There are a lot of other things that can look like sepsis that can make it hard to diagnose initially. Um, the other thing that's frustrating is, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has spent billions and billions of dollars trying to find a sepsis-specific treatment and nothing has worked out. Um, so we have no therapy that's targeted directly to sepsis itself. And, uh, we know from many, many studies that the, the sooner sepsis is diagnosed and treated, the better, and each you know, hour delay in treatment leads to an increased mortality. So um, all of those things contribute to it being such a high, highly morbid uh, disease. I'm just going to run through quickly uh, some definitions um, of the, the various things that people talk about with um, sepsis. So you know, people kind of start out with it's called the SIRS, the Systemic Inflammatory Response System, the syndrome rather, which is just 
Um, patients who present with alterations in hemodynamics, alterations in temperature, uh, white blood cell count, those sorts of things. Sepsis is where you get kind of a surge type picture, but it's in the context of an infection. Severe sepsis meaning it's progressed to the point where there's organ dysfunction, and then septic shock obviously is persistent hypotension, and then in the extreme it progresses to multi-organ failure. Um, kind of as I alluded to earlier, one of the things that makes it challenging is that a lot of other diseases can present very similarly. So people with acute MI, acute congestive heart failure, pancreatitis, pulmonary embolism. You know, here, unfortunately, a lot of drug overdoses and drug toxicities can look very much like sepsis, um, various endocrine uh, syndromes for, for others. So there are a lot of other things that can, can look like sepsis. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the definitions of sepsis that I think we've all understood. And like a lot of things in medicine, I think once people finally understood that the decision was made that we have to rethink the definitions. So the, the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine convened a group um, in 2016 to kind of look at, at an alternative or, or new mechanism for defining sepsis and septic shock. And they kind of eliminated the step of severe sepsis or proposed eliminating that. Um, De-emphasize SERS, and there's a huge controversy. I could give an entire Grand Rounds talk about, you know, what's the best mechanism out there to um, identify patients who might be septic. So, you know, this group said SERS is just not specific enough. They propose that people use um, SOFA or QSOFA, and I won't go into them, but there's been a lot of pushback on this because those um, definitions are no more accurate uh, according to a lot of studies than, than SERS and identified patients might have um, sepsis. So what, what this group has proposed is that we, we just look at sepsis versus septic shock. And um, you know, again, sepsis is you know, some infection that then triggers a kind of abnormal host response um, leading to organ dysfunction. And, and when you look at kind of just sepsis, mortality is you know, somewhere in the range of 10%. When patients progress to septic shock is when the mortality really starts to go up. You know, depending on the study, you look at anywhere from 30 to 50 percent uh, mortality associated with septic shock. So a very, very dangerous uh, entity. So I'm going to sort of go through now some of the more specific treatments uh, geared towards septic shock. And this is an old study, uh, as you can see, from 2001. But I, I, I always talk about it in sepsis because this is really one of the pivotal studies that was done in critical care medicine, really did change the, the field, and, and so I think it's always worth talking about. Um, when this was published in 2001, I was in my residency, and this was drilled into our brains, and when I was a fellow, I was drilling it into the brains of the uh, residents and students working for me. And interestingly, this study was a single center study at the Henry Ford Hospital out in Detroit, and really two people, uh, Manuel Rivers and then a med the, uh, emergency department resident were the two main people who did this study. So just the power of essentially two people who could do a study that really changed uh, critical care medicine. So single center study, again, 263 patients for ICU medicine, that's not an unreasonable number of patients, um, even though it, it looks fairly small. And they randomized patients presenting to the ED with sepsis to either the standard of care at the time in the late 90s, early 2000 range versus a, a more protocolized approach, which I'll get to in a minute. And it really was a dramatic uh, difference. So uh, mortality, as you can see, dropped from close to 50% to about 30%. So really a substantial uh, mortality benefit. So, so this was the protocol that they used in the study. Um, and I won't go through it in, in detail, but essentially what they, they did was to kind of try to do a more sequential approach. So the first thing that they looked at once they made the decision that the patient had sepsis was um, they put a central line in and then measured the central venous pressure. And if it was low, they volume resuscitated the patient um, until they got their map, uh, until they got their central venous pressure up to an acceptable level. Then they looked at the mean arterial pressure if that was still low, then they started pressors. Then they looked at the venous um, O2 sat from the central line. And if that was low and their crit was low, they would transfuse red blood cells to try to improve the oxygen delivery to the cells. And then if the hematocrit was okay, 
then they would start inotropes, and this study was primarily WME. And as, as I showed, the, they achieved a substantial mortality benefit. And this was all done in the first six hours from when they hit the door in the ED. So, you know, as, as you would expect from the protocol, the difference between the, the protocol patients and the standard of care at the time was the protocol patients got a lot more fluid in the first six hours. By 48 hours, the, there was no difference in how much cumulative fluid the patients had, but they got much more fluid in that first six hour window in the protocol approach. More red cells obviously uh, got pressors sooner um, were the main differences between the three. But, you know, at the time this came out, we all kind of looked at this and, and it adapted that as our practice, but there was always a lot of debate about which of the elements of the protocol were the more important things. Did, you know, was it the fluid resuscitation and the, the central venous pressure monitoring? Was it the red cell transfusion? Was it the, the inotropes? And there was a lot of debate in the field. And, you know, usual care continued to progress. So there was a lot of discussion about whether you really needed to follow this protocol rigorously or not. So in the, in the kind of mid-2000s, three different studies came out that um, really kind of also changed our approach. One in the U.S., one in the U.K., and then one primarily in New Zealand and Australia. They had a few European sites there, but it was primarily New Zealand and Australia study. All of them were fairly similar in that they were all ED-based and what they did was compared the early goal directed therapy similar to the, the Rivers uh, protocol versus what was kind of usual care at that time with a lot of discretion left to the treating physicians as to how they were going to approach the treatment. And the interesting thing was all three studies um, showed that usual care was as good as early goal directed therapy, probably in large part because our usual care was much, much better at that point than it was in the, in the late 90s when the river study was done. Um, and then this was just a study published uh, just a year ago where they did a meta-analysis of those three studies that, again, showed the same point that um, there was no difference in 90-day mortality, meaning that you don't really have to use such a rigorous early goal-directed therapy approach if your usual care is reasonable. So, with all of that, people said, well, what, you know, how should we then approach uh, patients with sepsis? And what people, and how can we kind of formalize, if you will, uh, the, the best practices? So people uh, came up with the idea of sepsis bundles as is being done with a lot of other disease entities and CMS and other regulatory uh, groups, and, and Donald touched on this in a little more detail, have pushed the idea of sepsis bundles to, uh, to improve our sepsis care. So they kind of divided into a three-hour bundle and then a six-hour bundle. And for patients who, who present with severe sepsis or septic shock, in the first three hours, the goal is to get antibiotics in as fast as possible, blood cultures drawn prior to antibiotics to hopefully give you the best chance of identifying the, the culprit organism, and then checking the lactate as a measure of tissue perfusion and if it's elevated, repeating the lactate to make sure you see whether your resuscitation is working or not. And then for, for the septic shock subset of people, they add in um, these other elements. So within the first three hours, you have to do obviously all the things on the first slide, but also uh, give them a fluid bolus at least equal to 30, milligram, uh, 30 milliliters per kilogram of fluids. And then within six hours, if they're still persistently hypotensive, um, you have to have started vasopressors within that six hour window. And then the thing that's kind of driving us crazy uh, to an extent is they also want either a physician or, or advanced practice provider taking care of the patient to re-examine the patient with six hours and put another note in the chart documenting um, the patient's response to uh, the fluid management um, and antibiotics, et cetera, to see if they're improving as you would expect them to improve. So this was, a, I thought, an interesting study um, uh, published again last year. So New York State um, started mandating that all the hospitals in New York uh, implement a sepsis bundle program uh, starting in 2013. So this study looked at starting kind of in 2014, so 
you know, let, let the hospitals kind of get their, their bundles in place and their, their management approach in place. And so starting in 2014, when hopefully all the hospitals were, had their systems running smoothly uh, in, from, from then until June of 2016, and they looked at almost 50,000 ED patients over that time frame in New York State um, with sepsis, and they looked to see, you know, how did those patients do uh, with the treatment um, that they were getting with the sepsis bundle. And what they found was that the longer it took to finish the treatment according to the bundles, the increased mortality, the higher the mortality associated with any delay in treatment. And then when they tried to parse out of the different elements of those bundles, what seemed to be the most important. And the one uh, thing that stood out was that the timeliness of antibiotics was really the key. And it makes sense when you think about it, because this is an infection-driven syndrome, and you know, so using antibiotics to treat the underlying cause uh, makes sense. So that the thing that really stood out as an independent predictor of mortality was timeliness of antibiotics. Fluids, all the other things, weren't independently associated with uh, mortality to the degree that antibiotics were. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about the other elements of uh, the sepsis bundles and the sepsis management. Uh, so one is, you know, what what's the appropriate uh, choice for products for volume resuscitation? And you know, this is an area where you can have passionate debate in, in ICU circles about the whole crystalloids versus colloids. And really the bottom line is that it doesn't really matter. Um, there's no data that says that colloids are any better than crystalloid, even though physiologically you would think that giving colloid keeping more fluid intravascularly should be better. But you know the studies have shown, and I highlight one here, that um, other than patients who are treated with albumin tend to get off pressors a little bit sooner than patients who are treated with just crystalloid. There's no other difference, and certainly no mortality benefit that, that can be shown. Um, with albumin versus, uh, versus crystalloid. So if you want to use albumin, you can point to getting your patient off pressor sooner. If you want to save money and just use crystalloid, you can say it doesn't affect their mortality at, at the end of the day. The most important thing to a patient is obviously, did I survive or not? So, um, so a lot of debate currently about um, crystalloid, though, in terms of what's the best uh, crystalloid to use. You know, historically, I think most of us have used uh, normal saline. There's, there is some data starting to accumulate. I don't want to kind of over, over sell it, but there's some data starting to accumulate that maybe balanced solutions may um, confer some benefit. So there was one meta-analysis that suggested a small mortality benefit, um, a pilot study in, in an Australian ICU, single center in an Australian ICU showed less kin kidney injury when balanced uh, solutions were used. And then a small, uh, one small uh, ED study in New York City uh, showed a mortality benefit with balanced crystalloids. The theory in terms of why balanced crystalloids may be better is that with normal saline you get a lot more hyperchloremic acidosis induced by your, your fluid resuscitation, whereas you don't get that same degree of acidosis from uh, balanced crystalloids. This was actually a study just published a couple of months ago from Vanderbilt where they looked at um, almost 16,000 patients across five ICUs at Vanderbilt where they uh, randomized people to resuscitation for sepsis with balanced um, fluids versus saline. And they had kind of a composite endpoint of uh, death, a need for new uh, renal replacement therapy or persistent renal dysfunction. And there was a statistically significant decrease in that endpoint in the balanced group versus the saline group. When they looked at each of the individual dead endpoints, um, there was no difference between, between the three. So, you know, the, the, the bottom line with crystalloids or with fluid treatment is, you know, you can use crystalloids or albumin. There isn't a strong argument for one over the other. Um, colloids obviously are a lot more expensive. Um, theoretically, with human albumin, there is a, a little bit of a risk, but it, it's pretty minor. Um, one thing we do know is synthetic starches are absolutely bad and should not be used in uh, patients with septic shock. 
And as I said, the, the normal saline versus balanced crystalloid is, I think, still not completely settled. But you know, we're certainly using a lot more balanced uh, IV solutions in our practice. Um, I think there is a signal developing that there's probably less kidney injury associated with balanced crystalloid. So you know, we're using that increasingly. But the most important issue is whatever you pick, just do it fast. Get the patient resuscitated as quickly as you can. Really, timeliness is probably more important than what you choose. Um, Going to talk a little bit about pressors. Um, these are kind of the, the standard ones that we use most routinely in the ICU. Um, the, the Surviving Sepsis uh, Campaign, which is a, a group of sepsis experts who uh, meet periodically and review the literature and, and you know, make recommendations on, on what they think is the current state of the art and the best practice based on the, the data. And their recommendation is norepinephrine should be the first choice for uh, pressors and septic shock. And that after that, probably vasopressin or epinephrine as your second agent. And dopamine only in very, very high, highly selected patients. And this is a big change, because when I was in training, the, the teaching, the dogma at the time was that norepinephrine or dopamine were kind of equivalent in, in sepsis, and we use the two reasonably frequently, and, and it shows some data, but dopamine has now really fallen out of favor in, in septic shock. So, and this was a, a study that I thought was really interesting when it came out uh, now about uh, eight years ago, where, you know, because prior to that, we didn't really have a lot of head-to-head -head data about uh, what pressor was used, so a lot of our, our thinking was kind of physiologically driven as opposed to really data based on a lot of data. So this study was a multi-center randomized trial looking at a diverse group of uh, patients with shock, mostly septic shock, but a fair bit of cardiogenic shock and hypovolemic shock. And they looked at 28-day uh, mortality as their primary endpoint. And what was interesting about this study, you know, this is the, the forest plot of, for each of the subgroups, is you can see for overall the data kind of favored norepinephrine as being the better choice, but it didn't quite reach statistical significance. But the thing that really surprised us when this came out was up to this point, the thought had always been that in cardiogenic shock, dopamine made the most sense because of all the inotropy and chronotropy benefits that you get with dopamine. And yet in this study, the one group where it was unambiguously bad to use dopamine was cardiogenic shock. So it really kind of stood our thinking on, on its head. Um, and, and the thought was that dopamine, by being so much more beta stimulating, actually was promoting a lot more arrhythmias and, and was actually promoting more cardiac dysfunction. So, as I said, th this and some other data, which I'll get to, has really pushed dopamine uh, much more into the background than it used to be. So, as I said, in our practice, certainly here um, and at Tufts, is norepinephrine has is, is long been our first choice, um, and now we almost never use dopamine unless someone is so bradycardic that we think the bradycardia is contributing to their hypotension. So, just you know, some other, other evidence, and, and we don't have a great, great amount of data about pressors, but this was a meta-analysis done um, in, published in about five years ago now where they looked at the studies um, for where there was data about norepinephrine versus dopamine. Um, as you can see, 11 studies, um, varying quality, of course, is in a meta-analysis with about 3,000 patients, which in the ICU realm, 3,000 patient study is pretty good. You know, in cardiology, they get tens of thousands of people. We're lucky if we get hundreds to a few thousand. So this is actually a pretty good sized study. And what they found was a statistically significantly higher rate of mortality in patients with septic shock treated with dopamine. So again, further evidence that really, other than in very isolated cases, essentially patients with significant bradycardia, dopamine does not make sense in, in sepsis. Um, I put this other study in just because it, it's interesting. It was, as, as we all well know, increasingly we're struggling with periods of shortages of any number of drugs. And in 2011, there was a period of time where norepinephrine was in huge shortage. So this study just looked at, well, what did people do when they couldn't use norepinephrine? Um, and phenylephrine was the, the most commonly used substituted during that time period. And what they found was during the, the shortage period, phenylephrine, uh, morta the mortality was much higher when, patients were, uh, when physicians were treating patients with uh, phenylephrine. So, you know, again, that also reinforced the idea that norepi is probably our best first choice. So I'm just going to 
touch on a couple of quick um, things in terms of other things you may have heard about or seen that are still being investigated. So one is a little bit counterintuitive, but there's some preliminary studies that are looking at esmolol uh, for the treatment of patients with septic shock who are persistently tachycardic, and it seems counterintuitive to use a beta blocker to lower pressure on someone in septic shock. But the, the idea is that in some patients when they're, they're that tachycardic, it may be because there's such an excess catecholamine surge going on with the patient that they're actually getting a degree of cardiac dysfunction because of essentially adrenergic overload. So by using esmolol and blocking some of that, you may actually improve cardiac function. And again, some intriguing preliminary data, um, but we're waiting for some bigger studies to see whether this really is gonna make sense or not. Um, you know, these studies really looked at, as I said, patients who were persistently tachycardic, heart rates above 100, and using esmolol just to get them down to kind of the 90 to 100 range in terms of heart rate. Um, thymine, there's, there's reasonable data about thymine being beneficial to treat lactic acidosis. Um, this was one uh, small study that um, looked at using thymine in septic shock, and what they found was people who, when they, when they got the data back afterwards, that were thymine deficient coming into the ICU, uh, did seem to benefit from a mortality standpoint. Um, so we've increasingly been using thymine kind of across the board for, for patients in septic shock with lactic acidosis. Except again, for earlier this year, we had a couple of months when there was no thymine available. I mean, even basic things like that are in shortage periodically. So we had a couple of months when we couldn't use it at all. Um, and then the last one, actually this made it into the, the press a fair bit earlier this year. Um, a group down in Virginia published some data with um, using a combination of hydrocortisone, thymine, and vitamin C. And, and published, you know, miraculous, essentially, uh, benefits where, where virtually everyone was surviving with this cocktail of uh, those three agents. There's now an ongoing multi-center study to look at whether, you know, this really works or not. You know, I always caution, um, I think one could do an entire grand rounds and everything that looked great initially for sepsis and that flamed out. So, you know, I think you have to wait a little bit. This was, again, almost in the too good to be true category, but we'll, we'll see when we get some better data whether that's um, going to be used or not. So, so that's my part. I'm going to turn it over now to Adam, who is going to talk about the, the more uh, sepsis specific syndromes and their treatment. So I'm going to get a little bit more specific. Um, so we're going to talk, uh, as Greg mentioned, a little bit a little bit about what doesn't work, and there's a long list on that. And then we're going to talk about some specific sepsis syndromes, because I think we often get into the uh, trap of talking about sepsis as this nebulous clinical evil, but we have to remember that there is a specific infection behind it, and we are not just treating sepsis, we are treating the infection that causes the sepsis, so we've got to make sure we're doing that correctly. So we're going to talk generally about pneumonias, urinary tract infections, skin and soft tissue infections, and abdominal infections. And if we have some time, although there's not much in the way of future therapeutics in general at this point, besides what Greg talked about with the hydrocortisone, vitamin C, and thiamine, and we're all hoping that turns out to be true, because if it is, it would be a genuine miracle. All right, so what has been tried and failed? So the most recent big failure is, is activated protein C. Uh, and thought to be promoting fibrinolysis and inhibit thrombosis, thought to mitigate the kind of the procoagulant response in sepsis that would lead to organ dysfunction. The original prowess study showed an absolute uh, mortality benefit in those who were primarily the sickest with an Apache score greater than 25, but that uh, data was found hard to replicate um, and definitely had an increased risk of bleeding in all these patients. They did a repeat trial in 2011 which showed essentially no benefit with some increased risk of bleeding, and it was voluntarily withdrawn from the market in 2011. And this joins a long list of things that have been looked at and tried in the, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry as well to say, all right, is there something that we can do as a general sepsis treatment? And these have all been tried and failed. And I'm not gonna go through all of them. So why have they all tried and failed? So as Greg mentioned, sepsis is an incredibly heterogeneous condition. 
that affects an incredibly heterogeneous patient population. Your 18-year-old patient is very different from your 75-year-old patient. Your patient with a skin soft tissue infection is very different from your intra-abdominal infection is very different from your pneumonia. So these are all hard to get a very clear signal out of all the noise of all the different uh, heterogeneity in your thing. And then mouth sepsis turns out is not like human sepsis. Um, and a lot of these things look great in mice, but it turns out often that does not translate into human. And so the fundamental basis for kind of this initial research into sepsis may be potentially flawed. Um, and then there are some people who are gonna die from sepsis no matter what we do. So the, there's always gonna be an underlying failure rate there. And so there may not be, may not be anything we can do for some of these folks. So what does work? As Greg mentioned, appropriate and timely antibiotic therapy. That's a big thing. And then source control. So if you have something that you can fix surgically, or uh, uh, um, do that if you can. So we'll talk a little bit about timely antibiotics. So um, this uh, study from 2006 um, showed that each hour after hypotension onset was associated with an absolute 7.6% decrease in survival um, if you do not give antibiotics at that time. So hours and minutes count. And then this one from 2010 showed that time from triage to appropriate antibiotics, if you had less than one hour versus greater than one hour, mortality difference of nearly 15%. And, time, and this is still back when we were doing more early goal directed therapy, but time from qualification for early goal directed therapy to appropriate antibiotics, if you had less than one hour versus greater than one hour, you're talking again nearly a 15% difference in absolute mortality. So getting people uh, antibiotics in a very timely manner is critical. But not only getting them antibiotics timely, but getting them the right antibiotics. So what is the appropriate antibiotic? An appropriate antibiotic is active against the organism where the organism is. So um, this uh, study is an older study, but they looked at observational study looking at uh, severe gram-negative infections with over 2,000 patients. So as Greg mentioned, fairly good uh, in terms of this type of study. And turns out, about, uh, in retrospect, about 32% of them were inappropriate antibiotics. So the uh, organism was resistant or was not appropriate antibiotic for that organism in about a third of these patients. And turns out, if you don't give the right antibiotic, you have a much greater mortality. It was 34% versus 18%. So if you give the right antibiotic, that's a good thing. So how do I choose the appropriate antibiotic? So we have to look at the clinical syndromes. This is where I, it's very important to just not think of sepsis as this badness NOS. We have to say, all right, what is causing the sepsis? What is driving the sepsis? And treat that uh, clinical scenario. I've had patients come in where they clearly have a skin soft tissue cellulitis and vancomycin would be a great drug for them. And I've had doctors say, oh, I gave them cefepime too. Why? Oh, because they were qualified for the sepsis protocol. Uh, well, okay, but cefepime is not really appropriate for that uh, infection. Um, we have to think and say, all right, we're treating the appropriate infection. So we treat our pneumonia is very different than we treat a urinary tract infection, than we treat a cellulitis. And we have to think about the patient epidemiology. Where are they coming from? What are they exposed to? Are they primarily a community dweller with very low risk for very uh, resistant organisms? Or have they been in and out of a nursing home for the last six years and they're coming from Tewksbury State Hospital with a history of, of highly resistant organisms? And so going back at their patient's own microbiologic history. So if they've been here several times before, we have a lot of data on them already. What have they had before? Have they had a history of a resistant uh, extended spectrum beta lactamase or a highly resistant pseudomonas or a history of MRSA? Okay, we need to make sure that we're taking that into account with our antibiotic selection. So we, I usually turn back the clock on their microdata at least a year on almost any patient that I see um, to see, all right, what have they had and what do we need to worry about? And then, what's our current antibiogram? This is available on PowerChart as well as in a variety of other places. So what are, is the resistance pattern for our current organisms out there? Um, how is our pseudomonas doing against levofloxacin? How is our E. coli resistance doing to some of these things? And so we have to say, all right, with, given our community, and this is a very localized antibiogram, what do we think is the best antibiotic for this patient if I have no other data? So looking at pneumonia. So for community-acquired pneumonia, these are patients that are coming from the community, not a lot of healthcare exposure. The vast majority of them are, prim are primary and recommended 
uh, treatment of ceftriaxone and azithromycin. Um, if you have a severe uh, penicillin allergy or some other significant reason why you can't give either one of those, levofloxacin is a reasonable alternative, although it is probably a little bit more expensive with some higher risk of some side effects. If they do have some, community, uh, some risk factors for community-acquired MRSA, so MRSA is becoming kind of more prevalent within the community in general. So if they've had history of, of multiple abscesses, if there's a necrotic pneumonia, um, or particularly if uh, post-influenza pneumonia, those are all more likely to be MRSA, um, you can add some vancomycin. Right? Um, one of the things I always think about in patients, okay, say they have you know, a vancomycin allergy, we don't want to use vancomycin, we have to use an antibiotic that not only kills the bacteria that we're looking for, but it kills the bacteria where that bacteria is. So some people say, okay, maybe we can give this patient daptomycin. But daptomycin is inactivated by surfactant in the lung. It is inappropriate to give it for people with MRSA pneumonias. So you have to think about not only the organism, but is it getting to where it needs to be. Right. If they have risk factors for pseudomonas, these are relatively uncommon, but in your severe COPD patients, chronic oral steroid administration, um, severe alcoholism, um, or frequent prior antibiotic therapy, but primarily in the community, you can think about an anti pseudomonal, but these are very few and, uh, and far in between. But um, that would be piperacillin tazobactam, cefepime meropenem, plus minus levofloxacin if you want to do some double coverage. Then we move on to what we call healthcare associated pneumonia or hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator associated pneumonia. These are all kind of bundled in under the same kind of microbiologic umbrella because they all have very similar uh, organisms associated with them. So these are a much higher risk for resistant organisms that are here within our hospital, MRSA, pseudomonas, and atypicals being much more less, much less likely. So um, they're not going to have kind of generally pick up Legionella in the hospital. Um, and again, this is generally vancomycin plus an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam, and that's dealer's choice of piperacillin tazobactam, meropenem, cefepime, all of those would have general reasonable coverage. And if you look at our antibiogram, particularly for anti-pseudomonals, those are all fairly equivalent in terms of our coverage here. Um, if they have a vancomycin allergy, so a genuine vancomycin allergy, which is fairly uncommon, linazolid is a good appropriate choice for MRSA coverage within the lungs. As I mentioned, daptomycin is probably not a great choice for uh, that, but linazolid has excellent lung penetration. And then if they have a severe penicillin allergy, not just like, oh, I had a little rash or I got some nausea, but we're talking anaphylaxis, astrianin would be a good alternative. It does have good anti-pseudomonal activity, although not quite as uh, extensive as the anti-pseudomonal beta-lactams. And if you're really in a pinch, you can use the aminoglycosides, but I generally try and avoid those as much as possible. So for urinary tract infections, the vast, vast, vast majority of these are usually gram-negatives, and the majority of those gram-negatives are usually E. coli. So then we have to look at our epidemiology, which dictates probable resistance. So what have they grown in the past? Has this lady who's come in with frequent urinary tract infections pretty much always grown the same E. coli that she's grown nine times before? Well, guess what? We should probably treat that same E. coli and making sure we're covering appropriately. So, or have they grown an ESBL in the past? All right, we want to make sure that they're they're being adequately covered for that, usually with a carbapenem, my favorite being erdapenem, uh, simple once a day dosing with less, uh, with no anti-pseudomonal coverage, so you're having a little less pressure on your anti on your pseudomonas there. Or do they, in the rare instances, they've had history of enterococcus, that's the only major gram positive that usually shows up in the urine more frequently. And VRE being one thing we have to worry about there, that would be not covered by some of our standard regimens. So then we say, all right, you know, does this patient need either daptomycin or linazolid to cover for, ver for VRE in their urine? Um, if they have Staphylococcus aureus in their blood, that is a red flag. I mean, in their, in their um, urine, that is a red flag. All right? It is uncommon, particularly among patients that have not had any kind of frequent uh, instrumentation for them to have Staph aureus in their urine. It happens every once in a while, but it is very uncommon. So that is a red flag to say, is this a hematogenous seeding from an underlying bloodstream infection? The blood from the blood can get into the urine, and what you're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg of their infection. So you want to make sure you have blood cultures in that situation to make sure you're not missing an underlying hematogenous infection. And please always, always, always get a urine analysis to go with your urine culture. They are useless without one another. A positive urine culture without a positive urine analysis is not helpful. 
and positive urinalysis without a urine culture is not helpful. You need both of them to work together. And lastly, you need symptoms. So you gotta have a positive urinalysis, positive culture, and symptoms to go along with urinary tract infection. If you don't have all three of those, it is not a urinary tract infection. Even if you have a positive UA and a positive culture, if you are completely asymptomatic, that is the definition of asymptomatic bacteriuria, and that requires no therapy whatsoever. Okay, skin and soft tissue infection. So this can really run the gamut from mild, and here's your dose of, of Keflex and out you go, to severe life-threatening. The vast, vast, vast majority of these are, are gram-positive organisms. Um, pretty much in almost every single um, insect, for very, very rare cases, any closed skin infection, so cellulitis or abscess, is going to be a gram-positive, usually a staph or a strep of some version. Gram negatives are very rare unless you're talking open diabetic ulcers, not just patients with diabetes, but open diabetic ulcers and foot infections, or significant water exposure if they've been soaking, if they've been injured in a lake or a stream or water, and we're talking kind of funky organisms that come there. Otherwise, greater than 90, 95% of these patients are all going to be your standard uh, skin gram positives. Community acquired MRSA, as I mentioned, is becoming much more common, so it is something we have to kind of take into account. And particularly for these cellulitises, there's nothing really to culture mostly in these folks, and positive blood cultures are in those situations is uncommon. So you kind of have to assume that it might be there. Um, and usually treat appropriately. So I usually, vancomycin is still our first line agent. Um, if we, ha we do have a lot of other options if we have reasons to not use vancomycin. So if they have an allergy, if they're having highly variable renal function and chasing the vancomycin levels are going to be quite difficult. Um, the daptomycin, ceftarolin, or linazole are all good alternatives. Uh -huh. And then the other key point is source control. So if they have an abscess, it needs to be drained. All the antibiotics in the world for a significant abscess will not do it uh, very good. Um, you really need to get in there and break down the walls of that fortress to allow the antibiotics to get in there. If they have severe necrotizing soft tissue infection, that needs a surgeon as soon as possible to really control that uh, source. Uh, and so antibiotics are very important, but source control is equally important. So intra-abdominal infection. So again, this can run the gamut from a, a mild case of diverticulitis to what I like to refer to as an intra-abdominal bowel movement with perforated bowel, abdominal abscesses. These patients can be very sick. So the vast majority of these are gram-negative and enteric anaerobes. Now we generally assume the anaerobes are there even if we don't culture them because our culture for anaerobes, and particularly for most of our cultures, do not work very well. You have to get very specific anaerobic cultures, and even then, they don't grow very well. But assume the anaerobes are there and treat them treat as such. Um, you don't always need anti-pseudomonal coverage, but if you do happen to find it, so if you do, you know, find abdominal abscess and you put a drain into there and it comes back as pseudomonas, you want to treat it because it's there. Um, ciprofloxacin and metronidazole is a good option. My favorite around here is ceftriaxone metronidazole, primarily for our community dwellers. Uh, ceftriaxone has excellent coverage against pretty much our gram-negative panel, standard E. coli, things like that, um, in our community. Um, and metronidazole will pick up all of your um, uh, anaerobes very well. So that's my favorite. Piperacillin tazobactam, ertapenem, miropenem, and kind of your more sick or more um, resistant patients are also good options. But for your community-acquired patient who's coming in with kind of a relatively simple uh, diverticulitis or even a mildly perforated diverticulitis, my favorite is usually ceftriaxone. If they're very sick, if they're, if they're crashing in the ICU, um, or particularly, I like to worry about these more in upper uh, GI perforations, antifungal coverage, so there's more of a prevalence of uh, candida in the upper GI set tract, but you can get it in the lower GI tract. Doesn't always need to be there empirically, but if they're very sick until you can, the dust settles and antifungal coverage, such as fluconazole, is a reasonable addition. So, to go over um, what I've done, so we start by covering lane quickly based on the clinical scenario, their past culture history, the patient's epidemiology, and our local antibiogram. And that's very important to get the right antibiotics on quickly. Right? But then, almost as important, is narrow those antibiotics as your cultures return if, if possible. So if, you can get, if you're getting positive blood cultures and out they have MSSA instead of MRSA, 
then you need to make sure that you're treating that appropriately. So vancomycin is not always the best drug. And there's actually data to show that if you're treating MSSA with vancomycin, it actually has a higher mortality. So you want to make sure you're treating MSSA with an appropriate MSSA-specific drug, such as oxacillin or cefaflin are usually our best options in that situation. And with that, I will pass over to Don for some additional information on our specific data here at Lowell General. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go over uh, the core measure, the sepsis core measure, and review some um, data, some quality data. Okay, so I know Dr. Shoemaker did go over the core measure, so I'll just do a high-level overview. Um, it is a composite measure, so there are uh, four sub-measures. Um, the first is getting that initial lactic level uh, measurement, the blood culture is drawn before the antibiotics, and administering the broad spectrum or other antibiotics within three hours of the presentation of severe sepsis. Um, the second submeasure is repeating the lactic acid if the initial lactic acid is greater than two, and that's to be completed within six hours of the pre presentation of severe sepsis. Um, the third uh, submeasure is the IV fluid resuscitation with 30 mLs uh, per kilogram of the crystal fluids, and if, that's if the patient has hypotension, lactic greater than four, or if there is documentation of um, septic shock. It's okay. Oh. Uh, sorry. Um, and that is to be completed within three hours of septic shock presentation <coughs> in the Fourth um, submeasure is the vasopressors if there's persistent hypotension after crystalloid fluid administration, and that's to be completed within the six hours of septic shock presentation, along with repeating the volume status and tissue perfu perfusion assessment. Um, so the focused exam includes vital signs, the cardiopulmonary exam, capillary refill eval, a peripheral pulse eval, skin exam, or any two of the following, the central venous pressure measurement, central venous oxygen measurement, cardiovascular ultrasound, or passive leg raise or fluid challenge. Um, so this is our SOP1 core measure uh, rate for Q1 of this year, um, data pulled from our Truven Health Analytics. The blue bar graph shows all four of the submeasures together and what our rate was. In the yellow is the, um, the first submeasure, which is the uh, blood cultures, the lactic acid, and the antibiotics. Uh, the red is the six hour sepsis, which is the repeat lactic acid if it's greater than two. The green is the IV fluid resuscitation and the purple is the um, six-hour um, septic shock, shock treatment, which is the vasopressors and the repeat um, uh, volume exam and tissue perfusion assessment. Um, just from looking at this, we did really well um, with the three-hour and six-hour sepsis treatments and the three-hour septic treatment. Um, it looks like our area of opportunity would be for the six-hour um, the vasopressors and the uh, tissue perfusion exam and the, and the reassessment by the MD. Uh, this bar graph is just showing us the monthly um, rate for the sepsis core measure from the inception um, of the core measure back in October of 2015. Um, as you can see, there is some variation in the monthly rate. However, you do see the trend line going upward, um, so that is positive. Um, this is our severe sepsis and septic shock mortality rate. Um, we pulled this data from Crimson. This is from January of 2016 through April, um, trending upward. What we're finding is um, these patients have um, a severity of illness and a risk of mortality as being extreme. Um, they have higher acuity, they're very complex, they have multiple, um, cr multiple chronic condition, uh, comorbidities. Um, so the, the sepsis committee is really focused on this and decreasing 
um, the mortality rate. I will say that for April, the mortality rate was about 30%. We just found out yesterday our May mortality rate went down to 17%. So um, that's almost down by 50%. So we did really well with that for May. This graph is just showing what our mortality rate was um, this time frame two years ago. We were making some strides and making some headway. We were, you know, did have a downward trend. Um, so that's just a comparison of where we were two years ago. Um, this is a case mix index um, here. Uh, we pulled this data from Crimson. It was a 12 month period. On the left hand side is the case mix index um, with severe sepsis and septic shock. Um, and the case mix index on the right hand side with all diagnosis. Um, the case mix index for septic shock is much higher. Um, it's 2.46, which is double that of all diagnosis. Um, all diagnosis is 1.27. Um, so it's just indicating that our patients um, the, are more severe, they're more complex, there's much more diversity, um, and there's a need for a lot more resources and higher costs. So that's just a comparison of this uh, severe sepsis and septic shock to all diagnosis. Uh, this next slide is just discussing uh, the percent of uh, submissions that are not present on admission. So this is just basically saying majority of our cases, the patients are coming in with sepsis through the ED and they're coming in um, with, uh, with a present on admission. So our main focus for severe sepsis and septic shock is to uh, identification within um, the ED. And as you can see, um, left side is main campus and on the right side is Saints campus and we are lower than our cohort. So next steps, um, we did have our center on site a few weeks ago um, to discuss sepsis in our sepsis process. CERNA has met with staff in various departments um, different settings to really capture what our current state workflow and process is. They did department walkthroughs and interviewed frontline staff. Um, so the next step is to really, for CERNA, to review what our process is, um, discuss our findings with the sepsis committee, and then make further recommendations on, on ways on how we can optimize CERNA to improve um, our sepsis uh, management. So that's currently where we stand with the sepsis. So that's all I have. Thank you. Questions?